listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. This is my second night of drinking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Back among the living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's weird how that, what that does, though, when you, you're not drinking regularly is like everything just kind of tastes like alcohol to me yeah. i gotta i gotta get my palate back that's funny somehow yeah and i'm so i've been drinking this low proof stuff which is not what i usually drink and i was gonna say this that we're drinking tonight doesn't seem that low proof to me well it's it's 95 it's not i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't think i have anything that's well i don't have any bourbon that's or rye that's like 80 proof or really in yeah. in my cabinet yeah. Um, I've got, I think I've got a couple of scotches that are 80 proof. This is good, but or 86. I, I wouldn't like call that. it low proof though. <laughs> it's low proof I mean, for my cabinet. <laughs> maybe so, but to, to the average cabinet, I would say this is not low proof. Yeah. Almost everything in my cabinet is hundred proof or more. Yeah. Um, and there's an awful lot of stuff that's over 110. Yeah. Yeah. And I drink a lot of stuff that's over 110, like probably... Probably on average, what I'm drinking is like 110 to 115 proof. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> but right now, that just tastes like alcohol. All right. Yeah. I, like I'm not getting any of the I'm not getting any of the flavor out of it. So, um, yeah, I had to bump it down to 95. <laughs> and even then, I'm, it still just kind of tastes like alcohol. I'm not really getting a lot of the flavor out of it. I'm getting yeah. a little bit though. So yeah. It's an improvement. So if I if I do this for a few more weeks. Um, you know, then back to normal, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, my doctor said something about, you know, um, like fleshing out my system real good. And, uh, and I, I, and I said, so what I'm hearing you tell me is drink more whiskey. <laughs> so that's not what I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. I thought that's how you fleshed your system out. Yeah, like, yeah. it just seems like the most effective way to me. That's what I've always done. Yeah. Um, when I was in the hospital, they they were asking me about alcohol, and I I was like, oh yeah, like I drink, yeah. I drink regularly. I, and she, and the nurse is like, so you mean like a uh, couple of nights a week? I'm like, no, I mean like every <laughs> night. Like I have probably two drinks on average. Yeah. Every night, and then. <laughs> so she's asking me about like essentially, do I get DTs when I don't drink? Yeah. Um. Like, do I get shakes and sweats and stuff like that when I don't drink? And I, I said, not yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm working on it. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> and she was like, no, let's not, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, you, you live your life your way. <laughs> I'll do it mine, mine. Yeah. But, yeah so. Oh. Oh, that does seem horrible. Like I've known people that that were that way. Like they, yeah. if they didn't drink like constantly, pretty much, they would get the withdrawals. And yeah. I was like, yeah, no, that's not good. <laughs> no, I, I suppose not. And I, um, <laughs> I mean, you drink to enjoy it, not to, not for it to be. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, but I really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. Um. I uh, I remember years ago, um, this guy I knew uh, that I guess had been an acquaintance for a long time, and uh, said something along the lines about the, like this group of people that had known each other for a while. Like we weren't friends exactly, but we'd known each other f for a long time. Yeah. Um, and he says, "Well, yeah, now we've settled into our mediocre careers and mild alcoholism." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> that sounds about right yeah that's exactly it mediocre mm. careers and mild alcoholism it's, it's, a, it's always a life goal yeah. as long <laughs> as you keep in the mild right yeah <laughs> um so i don't know what to really talk about this week i uh i guess we can do updates on wars yeah uh, Are, is there still wars going on it, it seems to be the case yes <laughs> Um, there's something like 15,000 dead Palestinians at this point, more than a third of them are children. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the biggest news was the, um, Israeli occupation forces or Israeli defense forces or what Israeli military, um, attack on the Al Shifa hospital. Yeah. 
So, um, so they attacked Al Shifa and are occupying it, as I understand it now. Uh, it's generally, by international law, illegal to attack hospitals. Yeah, that's um, that was always my understanding, but <laughs> yeah, uh, and beyond that, just immoral. <laughs> Yeah, Israel gets a pass on this stuff. There's a whole lot of things that they've been doing for a long time in, well, I'll tell in you, contravention at of least, international law. So. At least in the media this past week, they haven't so much gotten a pass on this hospital deal. Yeah, like, that's the, a good thing. The um, media has been very harsh against them for, for what's went on there. Well, like I said before, I think that they've made a mistake They've overplayed that their they hand. Can, yeah, yeah. There's been some, there was some hubris that led to the attack in the first place, and I think that there's some hubris that's leading to uh, a that. shift in international opinion against Israel. Yeah. Um, I think that they thought that if they showed all these terrible acts uh, of <coughs> Hamas, that they would be given a, a clean slate to kind of do as they pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what Hamas actually did was really terrible. Uh, they have exaggerated some of the acts um, of the during the October seventh attack, yeah. um, and just kind of fabricated some things. And it's come out that those things were fabricated. They could have just stuck with what actually happened. That was plenty terrible. Yeah. Um, to to get world opinion on their side, but. But like once you start being exposed as, um, as exaggerating or fabricating incidents, then it calls into question everything else. Yeah. Um, to people, or you certainly don't. Hmm, you certainly don't come off as the victim as much when you're when you're exposed with lies about what the other side or uh, the other party did. Yeah. Um, and it was just unnecessary. Yeah, given what had actually happened. Yeah, it was yeah. just unnecessary. So, um, anyway, these hospital attacks, and they've been attacking. It's not just the Al Shifa hospital. They've been um, yeah, they've been doing launching this all airstrikes over the, on other hospitals all in over Gaza. Gaza yeah. um, but they justified it with claims uh, that Hamas uses the the bunker underneath the hospital as a base. <clears throat> now, this is just. Like, there's no evidence for this. It's just an assumption. They know that the bunker's there. Yeah. They know Hamas travels underground using tunnels. They assume that Hamas has connected tunnels to the bunker yeah. and that they they must be using this bunker well, because it's there. Well, they're in there now. So did they, were they able to find any evidence now that they're in there? Because, I mean, I've seen reports where they're like, they've got soldiers and stuff inside this hospital. Yeah. Um, since the raid, they have shown uh, about a dozen Kalashnikovs. That's okay. what they've discovered. So what is what is that? I don't know. The AK. Do I? AK. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kalashnikov. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's as far as I know. Okay. That's it. I mean, that's the I last mean, I, news that I saw about it. I saw they one had report. taking pictures where they had like a dozen weapons that they had found in the yeah. hospital. They have had... They have found really no evidence that Hamas is using the well, hospital as a base in any way. I, I did see one report that they were they had the soldiers in there, and they they had so they had taken it was a wall, but they had put like curtains on it, mm -hmm. and they were saying that that was possibly where they were like filming with the hostages to make it look like they were somewhere they weren't. Oh. Well, they definitely haven't found any hostages in the hospital. No, they didn't find any hostages, but they were the the claim was that that Israel was making those that that was oh. that's what was being done here is that they were using that room to house hostages, and that's the reason the curtains were on the wall mm -hmm. to make it look like they were elsewhere, you know, that they weren't in where they were. Well, the whole thing's kind of silly anyway because they, you know, um, Israel does say that they dropped leaflets on the hospital telling them that they needed to clear out the hospital. Yeah. So if generally you, people are in the hospital for a reason. Yeah. Well, they haven't been able to leave the hospital. That's certainly yeah. part of the problem. Um, also, uh, you know, Israel has uh, justified um, bombing ambulances, leaving the hospital and so forth, too. So like, where are you yeah. going to go? Yeah. Um, just like they said, they dropped leaflets in the north saying travel to the south. And then they struck uh, all the 
the travel route south, and then they're striking the south too. Yeah. Like so, people are staying in the north because I guess they'd rather die in their homes than in a tent or on the road. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's anyway the the other point that I was going to make is that if you think Hamas is using the hospital as a base, you think they're going to stay there after you drop leaflets saying that you're going to attack the hospital? Obviously, they're going to go to the next. Right. Place so they wouldn't wherever. be there anyway. So why bomb it? Yeah. Um. And it, it brings in the question of, like, is the, is the Israeli military actually targeting hospitals not to get Hamas, but to um, completely cripple or eliminate healthcare in Gaza? Well, I'm, I'm sure that's part of the equation. Well, I mean, but that's completely illegal, too. Well, yeah, as it should be. And immoral. <laughs> yes. Um, so so they, they went from being the, the victims to being the bad guys through their own actions here. Um, they've now killed more than 10 times as many people as were killed during the October 7th attacks. Like, at what point do you... I mean, you're, you know how up in arms the... Um, the American population gets when we hear about drone bombings by our own government that targeted a couple of terrorists and killed 50 other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, to the point that the, our government regularly lies about that yeah. um, to us. This is all kind of out in the open. Yeah. Israel's attacks on Gaza there. Um, they may be killing. There certainly are killing, I suppose some Hamas, terrorists or people involved in it but yeah but they're also killing a lot of civilians and a lot of kids yeah well and and i know benjamin netanyahu keeps talking about that like they're gonna root out hamas completely and completely just destroy hamas uh the problem there is you can't destroy an idea yeah, like somebody else will fill the place. Well, that's just it. I mean, you may get rid and of probably the, more radical than Hamas. Well, that's that was what I was going to say. Is the the more you try to just destroy an idea like that, the more radical it's going to become, mm -hmm. uh, because just by the nature of the violence. Yeah, you know, you can't oppress people forever without expecting some kind of reaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just no way that they can maintain this. No. Um, so it, what, what are your thoughts on the peace deal or not, I guess not peace deal, but the ceasefire, no, I guess they're for, talking about like a few days of ceasefire in order to trade hostages. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's at least a start. Okay. What my thoughts actually are is yeah. that, um, is that the Israeli government isn't serious, serious about it. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got reports coming out now, um, including uh, firsthand reports from IDF soldiers um, talking about how they were instructed to just kind of fire away, even though they, during the October 7th raids, even though they couldn't tell the difference between Israeli civilians and um, <laughs> Hamas gunmen. Yeah. Um, that they were just like told to kill them all. Yeah. So. I guess so. It turns out that the Israeli government doesn't care any more about its people than the Hamas <laughs> cares about the Palestinians about or that people. our government cares about uh, Americans. Yeah. Um, it seems to be a common theme with governments. Yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> Just saying. So, I mean, are they going to really give up a lot to get the Israeli um, hostages back? Uh, I, I doubt. It. I, I I don't think that it's being negotiated in good faith. Well, I know, but I I, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. and because that was really the the primary point of the raid was to take as many hostages as they could so that they could trade them for Palestinian yeah prisoners. Well, and I want to say, and don't quote me, but I want to say they the agreement is that they're going to get fifty Israeli hostages back, mm -hmm. and I guess a hundred and fifty. Palestinian? Yeah. I mean, Something there's a lot like of that. kids in prison in Israel. Yeah. A lot of Palestinian and there, kids. And it's all supposed to be women and children, mm -hmm. is, is what my understanding that, yeah. that they were going to be the first to be swapped. 
Well, that's cool. I, I mean, I, I hope that that happens. Uh, is Israel has a history it, of putting poison pills into agreements. Yeah. Well, this one's supposed to already be set up. Like, it's supposed to start mm-hmm. today or tomorrow. I don't know. It's like, really quick here. Yeah. Um, but but it doesn't help the the matter that Israel is still saying they're, that, like, this is just temporary, that they're going to press on through Gaza. Yeah, well, they've already... I think they've actually already launched it, but they they definitely have said that they're they're doing ground invasion of southern Gaza as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas, which is the place where they told everybody to go to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well. <Wow. laughs> so, I, I don't know what the end game is here for Israel. Um, it's th- a mess. I know that. Yeah, I I think that you're right. I think they overplayed their hand, and and because of the brutality of the response that they have lost the moral high ground. Yeah. Um, and it's shifted the inter- international opinion. Yeah. So, um, which I, I mean, I hope will result in a lot of international pressure to put an end to this thing. Oh, so I did see yesterday, I guess the BRICS nations were meeting mm-hmm. and, um, I don't know, like I say, I mean, I hate to put, faith in China and Russia and some of these countries. But I mean, they were talking about like a two state solution and like that, that different, that uh, like them as a large group or some big group is going to need to step in to mediate this, Mm -hmm. Um, which is kind of what we talked about on the last podcast, maybe the one before, I don't remember. Yeah. But we had kind of said the same thing that it was going to take, is going to take an outside group, um, that's not the U S that's a power outside powerful group to kind of mediate this and come to some kind of, you know, to, to get any kind of peace deal rolling. Yeah. Well, they, they've tried this before. Um, Israel doesn't want a two state solution. Well, no. And, and, and Israel knows as long as they've got the, the U S behind them, Mm -hmm. they don't have to give up uh, anything like that. I mean, there has already been a partition, like the, and the UN has passed, another 130 or something like that resolutions on the Israel-Palestine issue yeah. um, that haven't been enforced because the U.S. is the U.N.'s yeah. military as long force. As long as the U.S. is behind them, there's no changing this. Mm-hmm. And so there's already been the Oslo Accords uh, working towards a two-state solution, and there was the Arab Peace Initiative um, that we talked about before as well that uh, where the Arab nations, including Hezbollah, um, signed on and said that it would be acceptable to them to go back to 1967 borders, which the UN partition was 55% of, of Eretz Israel to, to be a Jewish state and the other 45% to the Palestinians. Um, 67 borders would mean that 78% was the Jewish state and, um, and Palestine was, uh, restricted to 22%. Yeah. Um, but and, and so, but they said that they would they would agree to that. They would accept Israel as a as a nation, yeah. If they went back to these sixty seven borders and just let Palestine have its twenty two percent to be its own state, yeah. Israel doesn't want it. No, well, that like I say, as long as we're behind them, there's no reason for them to. Yeah. Um, in Ukraine, uh, not a lot has happened. Yeah. Um, bad weather. <laughs> it, it, there's just kind of been I a just delay in the say, fighting. I saw some video the other day. I don't even remember exactly of um ah oh, what's his name the president of Ukraine Zelensky Zelensky was um I don't know it was some kind of beg for money I don't I don't remember exactly what you ever see from him yeah like I don't really remember a whole lot of detail about it other than you know he was I don't know he was in army fatigues and he was begging for money like I mean that's. <laughs> Like I don't have a whole lot more than that on Ukraine than that on Ukraine, but yeah, I um, I do like that. There's now they're now saying like you need to negotiate, yeah, some kind of peace deal here. Uh, I'm, yeah, because the big war is on the <laughs> is in the is in the Middle East. Yeah, well, I, I heard Zelensky complaining about um that they weren't getting their weapons shipments anymore because they were going to Israel instead. Yeah. Uh, he didn't say it exactly like that, but that was kind of the that was the, the point. implication. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I am still, however, disappointed that um, that the West 
the U.S. and Britain in particular did so much to prevent a peace deal a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, that could have ended this pretty quickly mm-hmm. with a few concessions. Um, and it wouldn't even, the only, the only real land concession that Ukraine would have had to make in that first deal uh, is Crimea. Yeah. Of actually being Russia. Yeah. Um, they would have had to accept the Donbass as, as independent. Yeah. Now they're looking at a situation where they have to accept Crimea, the Donbass, the two Donbass regions, and Zaporizhia and Kharkiv. Yeah, basically um, everywhere that Russia currently occupies. Yeah, uh, and yeah. where they had the like the four additional oblasts where they had the um, um, the votes to become a part of Russia. Yeah. Um, now they now Ukraine is having to give up all of those, and not just as independent. Like Donbass would have been independent previously. Now they will actually be a part of the Russian Federation, which is yeah. different. Yeah. Um, plus two additional oblasts, and there's no way they were ever getting Crimea back anyway. Yeah. Um, I think this is all better for the people in all those places. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're getting what they want, right? Yeah, because they were already they were already being oppressed by the Ukrainian government because they were ethnic Russian. They spoke Russian. Russian was outlawed in Ukraine after the 2014, like yeah. using the Russian language was outlawed in Ukraine after the 2014 coup. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they were already having a civil war. So, um, I think. I think for the people in those regions, it's probably better. Uh, now, part of the original concessions was that they would uh, allow Russian to be spoken in Ukraine and that they would um, not uh, oppress the ethnic Russians and, and so forth. But, you know, I mean, they'll still have to agree to that. There'd just be a whole lot fewer of them to, yeah. to deal with, yeah. which I think is actually better for Ukraine anyway. Yeah. Of course, if they had treated them reasonably to start with they wouldn't have had all the trouble <laughs> right i mean which is the same thing that you can say about israel and palestine yeah like if you if you treated them like everybody else if you treated them if you gave them respect and rights and and didn't try to oppress them and keep them down you might not have had so much trouble to begin with yeah um but yeah we're we're in the situation where they're they're now going to have to give up a whole lot more than they would have in the first place um, and they've lost so much in the intervening time. Yeah. In terms of people and infrastructure and, and so Oh forth. yeah, because it's just rebelized, Ukraine is. And of course billions of dollars that the West has spent there as as well. Oh yeah, yeah. And then there's that, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's so it's so ironic because we did all of that trying to bleed Russia dry. Mm-hmm. Like that was that was literally what we were trying to do. Is well, if we if we start pouring money into this, we can start bleeding Russia. Hey, if you believe Lindsey Graham, we destroyed half the Russian military. <laughs> yeah, is that is that where he's at? Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah, well, <laughs> of course. I mean, we've dug into that before. Essentially, he's. I, I the only way I think he can come to that number is that they've lost half of the number of people that they had at the beginning of the war. Yeah. Of course, they have a lot more people in the military now. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so in absolute numbers, the military is much bigger than it was before the war, and they have um, they have managed to uh, push their industrial production for military affairs much better than the West has. They're yeah. outproducing the West. Yeah. Um, oh, well. The... And now they have battle-hardened troops as well. Yeah, yeah. So they're uh, they're all ready for World War Three. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, all right. Oh man, my foot's going to sleep. All right, got to do something. Um, I, I guess that's our that's our war updates. All right. Yeah. Um, in good news for libertarians, maybe hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Argentina like- elected a libertarian as president yeah so like i don't i keep seeing this guy's picture he just to, all i see when i see him is wolverine uh from the Wolver, from the movies what's his i don't remember the actor's name but he looks like that guy that plays wolverine in all the movies yeah <laughs> um i don't know that's just my my take you ever away. been to south america i have not mm-hmm. Do they all look like that? Yeah, he he doesn't stand out particularly <laughs> stand to me. Out. Is uh, from my memories of, of uh, South America. That was a long time ago that I was down there, but yeah, um, 
There's just a different style. There's a different style. <laughs> well, well, that's... When I was down there, they were stuck in the 80s. I figured they've made it to the 90s by yeah, now. Well, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Javier Malay, yeah. I think. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, the it, It'll be interesting to see what happens. I, I don't know how effective he's going to be. Um, and, and, uh, and I've heard mixed kind of, so I haven't read into the guy a lot to be truthful with you, but I've heard about this mm-hmm. and I've kind of heard mixed reviews as far as like what brand of libertarianism is him. Oh, who cares? He's, he just got elected yeah. president of a socialist country. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it ain't big. <laughs> all, all I'm saying is, is like, he's not, he may not necessarily be like a Ron Paul Rothbard well, he's got a dog named after Rothbard. I know that. Does he? Well, yeah, may- maybe he is. Like I say, I, I, I'm just kind of going off what I've heard. I hadn't really read into him that much. But, yeah. But it will be interesting to kind of see kind of how it plays out. Yeah. I, I, I'm interested to see what he's able to do. I mean, he, you know, he's not a he's not an autocrat, so he can't just do whatever he wants. Yeah. Um, we'll see how much of an effect he he's able to have on that country. I mean, this is a, this is a, a formerly very wealthy country yeah. who now after 75 years of socialist politics, siphoning off their wealth is not <laughs> a wealthy country. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's experiencing over a hundred percent inflation and annually and like, uh, yeah. has like almost 50% poverty rate. Oh, wow. Like they're in, they're, they're in, in bad trouble. shape. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is the most interesting statistic I came across uh, for Argentina um, is that they have uh, they have six million roughly um, employees of private companies in the country yeah. uh, paying taxes that those taxes need to pay for 20 million people being paid by the government, either as government employees or as you know pensioners <laughs> essentially. yeah. Um, so Ooh. they, they've expanded their government to such a degree that a majority of the population is paid by the government and very few by percentage yeah. are actually like doing something productive, productive. <laughs> is yeah. what I would say. <laughs> um, oh, that's crazy, man. So, I mean, this guy's stepping in there. He's pushing, he's pushing open markets. Um, he's, uh, he's pushing elimination of price controls. Yeah. Um, he's pushing for the, uh, reduction of, of regulations, limiting, limiting the market in the country, you know, limiting economic activity. Um, there's a potential for a real boom. I mean, yeah. there's going to be some adjustment. It's not going to happen immediately cause it just can't. No. But, uh, but if this guy's able to institute some of these policies, um, and, and it's given time. How long of a term does he serve? Do you know? I don't know. Um, most of the countries down there have five or six year terms for president. Yeah. So six years would be a long time. I mean, that would probably be enough to start seeing some kind of yeah. movement. I mean, it may not be where you would want it, but mm-hmm. I mean, six years is a long time. Yeah. You're talking about opening up markets and letting the kind of the free market do its thing, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, six years, you could see some returns by then. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. And most significantly, though, is that he's just he's just generated a real shift in the population's politics. Yeah. Which like is... That it, it, it got so bad that people that had been consistently voting for handouts from the government is like, okay, this, this isn't, really isn't this working. This isn't working anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what we want to see in this country. I mean, not, yeah. not that it get that bad that it... Yeah. That, like that's not what we want to see, but I mean mm-hmm. that is the idea of the Libertarian Party is to kind of get these educate enough people to these ideas to start making some change. Yeah, you know, I mean that's yeah. I mean like I said I don't I can't speak for everybody in the Libertarian Party, but that's absolutely why I'm there. Mm-hmm. Like I mean that's the idea is the you know educate people, get them on board with so, at least the some of enough of these ideas to start getting some people elected and start making some changes. Yeah. I find it interesting that where we're seeing these political shifts is in South and Central America. Um, there was a, a lady uh, a couple of years ago running for president. I don't remember where now. Yeah. Um, who was like definitely a free market libertarian. Yeah. Um, who was, I think it was in Guatemala, maybe. 
Yeah. I can't remember now. Um, but these countries that have been uh, been pushing a socialist government form for a long time that are just failing economically. Yeah. Um, well, and that's where we're seeing these shifts. You've got to imagine, though, the people on the ground that are living through it. I mean, mm-hmm. they've kind of learned the lesson the hard way. Yeah. Like they've seen all of this stuff happen and... I mean, I've got to at least think that the ideas of libertarianism after living through that's like, man, well, man, mm-hmm. this makes a lot more sense than what we've been doing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Let's try something different. Anything yeah. different. Yeah. Anything <laughs> different. It's not yeah. working. Yeah. Like, so um, so I, I hope that he is able to institute a lot of this stuff. And I hope we see like a real turnaround in their economy. I think that that would, because there hasn't been a, a libertarian leader in the modern era, I don't think. I, I, no, nobody I can think of. Not. Yeah, I, I can't think of anyone either. And so it would be, it, it'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see if there's a real turnaround that we can point to and say, hey, look, this country instituted a bunch of these ideas that we keep espousing everywhere. Yeah. Um, that you say, oh, they would never work in real life. And look what it did for Argentina. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be something very powerful to point to. Yeah. You know. So let's hope it works out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) The other, you know, the other possibility is, of course, that like these ideas are instituted and it's a complete failure. And we're like, oh, well, you know, I mean, it seemed like a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, at the time. (laughs) No, we'll just we'll just adopt the communist uh, position or socialist position and say, well, that wasn't real libertarianism. (laughs) That wasn't real libertarianism. (laughs) Oh, man. Yes, that is. Oh, man. This is so frustrating. Um. So uh, there was like a little thing I wanted to talk about, about differences between where I position myself in the left and where I position myself in the right, but I'm kind of ready to wrap this up. I know you wanted to talk about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's tomorrow. Yeah. Um, It's, uh, you know, a holiday about how the pilgrims gave the Indians food for the winter or the Indians gave the pilgrims food. Food for the winter. One group gave another group food. Or and they had, um, I don't. I re- or the Indians attacked the pilgrims and took their food. Oh, in the is winter. That, that's not what I learned in school. Well, maybe it was the pilgrims <laughs> slaughtered the Indians and took their land yeah. in the winter. I don't know. It has something to do with winter and food. Yeah. Which the Indians call maize. Oh, is that right? And uh, yeah, that's that's what we're. St- I'm not real clear on the whole where Thanksgiving came from. Thing, yeah. I'll be honest. <laughs> I feel like you had it in the beginning, and then you kind of lost it somewhere. But <laughs> oh, all right. Well, <laughs> that's just it's just me though. I'll like, have to do uh, some research for next year. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh no, the only thing I really kind of wanted to say is like so. Just kind of looking around the world with everything that's kind of been going on the past, you know couple of years really but mm-hmm. um i don't know we're 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 really lucky to be where we're at like as bad as things can be seem like they are here in this country like we're one of the best places on the planet yeah because we're isolated and we're the ones doing the oppressing yeah i mean now our go- <laughs> you're right i was gonna say our government's pretty good at oppressing people all over the world yeah um, we, we are the country with the most powerful military the world has ever seen therefore we're in the good place (laughs) yeah i guess i mean it's gonna well we'll see what happens i mean we're already seeing some of the the bad outcomes here um and economically well i was gonna say because things aren't perfect here and it's Mm -hmm. really easy particularly talking about the economics to complain like it's really easy because there's i mean i I work in retail like i can tell you i mean the prices of everything's going up like i mean you don't I, i see my bills yeah, I mean, and anybody that anybody can see all of that. Like, I mean, there's plenty to be pessimistic about, um, but but at the same time, like, I mean, we're not having to run from missiles all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we're, we're drones. Not hearing drones flying over yeah, all the time. Or exactly. It's true. So, um, and people tend to romanticize the past, and I, I'm of the opinion that things are constantly improving. Um, well, if you look historically, I mean, we're, we live now in one of the most prosperous times. I mean, I, I say prosperous as in comforts, really. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we have more creature oh, comforts. We're, than, yeah, we're 
the wealthiest one tenth the one percent that the world has ever seen. Like yeah. the entire world is in the wealthiest one tenth the one percent the world has ever seen practically. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, yeah. Um, like I said, I think that there may be like little dips here and there, but the general trend is always. Things are getting better. Yeah. Things are always getting better. I think a hundred years from now, things will be better than they are now. And 500 years from now, things will be better than they were a hundred years from now. I mean, I, I think yeah. that the, I mean, as long as we're still here. Yeah. Right. As long as we like, can prevent world war three. Right? Yeah. Carl Sagan's big thing is like, how do we get through this ability to destroy ourselves without doing it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Know, and, but as long as we are able to get through this period of with the ability to destroy ourselves without doing it, yeah. um, then I think things will will always be better later. I've been yeah. I've been reading about um, this uh, book about Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. Because it is a piece of Americana. I may have mentioned this on the podcast already, but it's this piece of Americana that I don't really know much about. Yeah. And I, I find it really interesting. Because these are people that were just like robbing banks and stuff during the depression. Yeah. And they were considered heroes to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, robbing government stores, robbing banks. Um, and I think we're kind of heading towards that in a lot of ways. I see some parallels because of what had happened in World War One. People were generally not on the side of government and banks. Yeah. You know, like government and banks were kind of the bad guys to the average American at that time, which is why they, well, partly why they generated such renown. Now, this book goes into a lot of detail about um, how their exploits were exaggerated and romanticized by the media because newspapers were kind of dying at the time, too. Yeah. And they found, like we see today, that these kind of um, spectacular stories did better at generating revenue than like good hard news. Yeah. Um, so the, like they, they weren't quite the, I don't know. They weren't quite as impressive in real life as the, the stories the, that the are told. The media portrayed them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, but that was a, a big part of it was that people were resentful of the government taking their money to benefit and their lives, literally, in World War One, yeah, um, to benefit a few, um, you know, a few wealthy people that had made loans to allies, which is a, a lot of what got Wilson into the war. Is that he is being lobbied by people that said, "Well, we made some big loans to the Crown <laughs> in England, and they're losing this thing. We can't let them lose, or we will never get our money. We'll back. never get paid." Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Anyway, it, as usual, the the government acting for the benefit of a few while stealing from everybody else. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the the bank collapse. Yeah. At the beginning of the depression, and you know now bankers are out there foreclosing on all these farms and like so on. Yeah, bankers so, are definitely the bad guys when they're taking your house, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know what the, my point was, and oh, I guess it's just like generally like. You know, the depression was a rough time for people and like reading how people were living then yeah. um, really, uh, really kind of helps you focus on like how even though things aren't as good for me now as they were like three years ago in, in terms of economics, yeah. a hell of a lot better than that. Yeah, um, exactly. it's a hell of a lot better than West Texas. Uh, you know, during the Dust, Dust Bowl, Bowl and the Depression. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, I had a great grandfather that lived through the Depression. And, mm-hmm. um, like, I remember the stories from him just about, I mean, he was pretty well off. He was in a, his family, our family, I guess, um, did pretty well through all of that. But just the, the devastation and just like, just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine living through something like that. Yeah, when I um, when I worked for the uh, ambulance company in Atlanta, the the owner's mother worked in the in billing, yeah. and so when I moved off of the truck and into the office and started doing insurance billing, I spent like a lot of my days with her. Yeah, and uh, and she'd lived through the depression. She was, you know, six, eight, ten. I guess when it started, something. Yeah, know? and. Uh, 
And she, man, her stories were fascinating about living through that time. And I can't yeah. imagine that kind of need. And mm-hmm. she was pretty well off. Yeah. Again, like her family were tobacco farmers in North Carolina yeah. during the time. So they, they actually did okay. Yeah. But she talks about how, um, like people were always coming by looking for work and they would work for almost nothing. Yeah. And, um, that the neighbors would send their kids down to her house for dinner and they would stand by the wall during dinner and then they would pick from the scraps that were left after her family was done eating. Wow. And she said, you know, at the time she really resented that. Yeah. But then, you know, she grew up. And realized. And realized yeah. that these kids weren't eating at all if they hadn't been able to eat scraps off of their table. Yeah. And it just, oh man, it's just kind of unreal to imagine that kind of poverty. Yeah. Um, especially in a society that wants to work. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's easier to imagine that kind of poverty now when you got a whole bunch of people that just don't even want to work. Well, or in in a socialist setting where like everything's kind of mandated and controlled, like mm-hmm. you kind of expect that kind of poverty, but yeah. but in a capitalist country, you mm-hmm. just don't expect to see that. Yeah. Um and you know, I, I guess a lot of people blame the banks and so forth for this, but it was it really goes back again to government monetary policy, yeah. um, expanding credit, uh, you know, artificially expanding credit um, through control of of, uh, of uh, interest rates, and then um, realizing that there's more projects started than there's money or resources to complete. Yeah, and that causes the contraction and the crash. Yeah. Um, Man, it's a good thing our government's figured all of that out since (laughs) then, right? (laughs) Isn't that a relief? Doesn't that make you feel just warm and fuzzy? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. They they, they just go bigger now. Yeah, yeah. Which, which you know what that means, though. Like, that just means the crash is going to be, it has to crash at some point. Mm -hmm. Like, and that the bigger they go, the bigger the crash is going to be. Well, I I, I do kind of pine for a time where people had pride of their work. Yeah. Um, because that was one of the big things, like as I've talked to people about times during the depression and so forth, that's like one of the things that, that comes up a lot. That's just like, it feels like a, a difference between that generation and the generations alive today yeah. or that are working, working, working class. people today, yeah. Yeah. um, working age, whatever, yeah. um, is that like, is that they didn't want handouts. They, they wanted to work for their living. They, yeah. And people traveled all over looking yeah. for work, travel hundreds and hundreds of miles in a time where there weren't a lot of automobiles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where traveling sometimes meant like a mule in a wagon or just walking. Yeah. And, um, you know, would travel hundreds of miles for j- just uh, the just idea the of, thought of yeah. yeah, of a job in like terrible situation in mines and, yeah. Fields and whatever for 10 cents a day or, I mean, it's, yeah. and I just don't feel like there's a lot of people that would do that now, uh, no. that they would be like, no, I'm going to sit home. The government can just print money for me. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so, till that doesn't work anymore, but yeah. Um, and, uh, but you think, but you, it makes you think though, like even when we get to that point when the crash does happen, um, like, I mean, people, will people even care to go try to, to find, I, I mean, I don't they know. They will if they're starving. I mean, yeah, they won't have much of a choice. I, I don't know. But there's, there's definitely, and I just know this from my personal experience, like I always, anytime a, um, an older person, senior citizen or whatever comes looking for a job with me, they'll always get one because like those people take pride in what they do even if it's something minor and minute, like they, they always take pride. And that's something that you just don't see anymore. People don't take pride in what they do. Yeah. And it's, I, I know that's such like a common trope that, Oh, you know, the younger generation, they just don't care. Mm-hmm. But, and, and that's not an absolute because I've got plenty of young people that work for me that do have that and do care. Yeah. But there's a, there's a girl at my office that if I started my own company, she is the first person that I would try and poach and she's like 25. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a few of those working for me, like mm-hmm. I say, so they are out there that, but they're not as easy to find as they used to be. Yeah. I mean, I've been managing for a long time and, um, 
at this point I have been. And like it used to not be that hard to find that person, mm -hmm. and it is now. Yeah. Like you've got to go through a lot of people to get to the one. Well, people don't want to be defined by their job, and I get that to an extent. And, the, and I, I'm not still, defined by my job, but... Oh, absolutely, but, I'm not defined by my job. But, but my I job is an important part of my... Well, I do take pride in it. I don't know, like my image of myself or whatever. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a great job. I mean, it's a, it's a good job. No. Um, but, the, but I'm good at it. Well, my uh, thing is... And I, I like what I do. I'm good at it. And it affords me... Um, like, I could... I could be more ambitious. Like I recognize that I could be more ambitious and get a, a better job with higher pay. Yeah. And more work required. And like what I do is something that I like. I like the people that I work with. I'm good at what I do. And it affords me opportunities to do other things like podcast and write. And, you know, well, this is kind of the way I look at it is like my job may not define me. That's not absolutely who I mm -hmm. am. But it's a link in the chain. Yeah. Like, it is a part of who I am. Right. Like, it, it's not everything. It shouldn't be everything. But it's part of it. Mm -hmm. And it should be part of it. Yeah. Even if it's something silly. Like, I mean, even if you're the... What's the old... Um, if you're a bricklayer or a swine herder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I was thinking of... Um, oh, I can't think of it now. It's gone. But it, it, I don't know. Just taking pride in what you do is important, regardless mm -hmm. of what it is. Yeah. So, yeah, whatever you do, do your best at it as, yeah. as kind of just and, the and be thankful to be living in the U S and not yeah. Ukraine <laughs> or Guatemala. <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. Or, or Argentina. Or I was going to say Argentina. Yeah. So or Palestine. Yeah. No, there is no Palestine. I was going to say Gaza yeah. <laughs> or the West bank. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's there's plenty of worse places to be, and and all times before this are worse. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, this will be worse than all times in the future. I suspect. I don't know. I, well. I kind of <laughs> hope it keeps you know getting moving, better. Yeah, moving yeah. forward, progressing. Well, I'm just saying, we live in the south down here. I don't know if I could live down here without air conditioning. Yeah, <laughs> so. no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so like you're playing your entire summer of like air conditioning is like oasis. Yeah, like you know? you're like from playing air your whole day <laughs> about moving from oasis to oasis of air conditioning. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, but, uh, we might be past that. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping that this is that's the end of air conditioning for this year. We oh yeah! Like a oh, for this year, coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, you're definitely right for for this year. <laughs> I, I I had hoped that we got there a couple of weeks ago, but I had to turn the air conditioning back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. maybe this time. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe, maybe this time. Uh, I know my power bill would appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I've got the uh, the whole air system turned off right now. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful time of year. Mm-hmm. The the month, <laughs> <laughs> right. the month where you need neither air conditioning nor heat. Yeah. Uh, well, if that two weeks something like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up. We'll talk about the other stuff some other time. All right. Because it, it's not topical exactly. It's just something interesting. I thought something on your on your mind. So, um, you know, I'm uh, I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful we got this podcast. I'm thankful that we got the listeners out there that we do. Um, I'm thankful for air conditioning. And I'm thankful for air conditioning, even though I don't need it tonight. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, we'll be back next week. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave reviews. The more stars, the better, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. Tell your friends. Um, I like a word of mouth kind of, you know, progression yeah. on this thing. That makes me feel better than any of the rest of that stuff. All the rest of that stuff does help the algorithm find us, yeah. which is nice. Even though we talk about things that the algorithm doesn't really like a lot of times. So you can help with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Also through word of mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.